Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Gross from the University of Cambridge, who's going to talk about Open FJRW Theory, which is a new acronym, I think, which stands for no, no, Fun. No, it's been around for, for 20 years. Is it? Well, it's the first time I heard it. Okay, fine. Uh, so it stands for Fun Jarvis Ram Witten, in case you are as uneducated as I am. Yeah. All right, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let me start by sharing screen, uh, and then you won't have to look at my face. You can just look at the, the notes. Um, so is this all visible now? Very well. Uh, is this uh, is the notebook visible now? Yeah, it's visible. Um, I guess most of us are watching this on a horizontal screen. Ah, so if okay. you want to take advantage, yeah, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Okay, yeah, so now it looks bigger. Yeah. Uh, everybody, if you feel it small, you can click on top in view options and and choose zoom ratio to be larger. Okay. So um let's write down the title of the talk, open FJRW theory. And uh, this is joint work with Tyler Kelly and Ron Tesler. Tyler is at, at University of Birmingham. Okay, so maybe first uh, uh, briefly review what Van Jarvis Ron Witten theory is. That's theory developed by Van Jarvis and Ron with, um, of course, as usual, inspiration from, um, from Witten. Uh, so the original motivation was to develop an enumerative, uh, an enumerative theory. of uh, singularities, or maybe more familiarly to some people, or uh, Landau Ginsburg models. So the basic situation is a kind of mirror symmetry. Um, so we might have Correspondence. I'm going to be very vague and then get much more specific in a second. Uh, but we might be given, for example, a function, uh, typically some kind of weighted homogeneous polynomial uh, on Cn, so function and variables, and some group G, which acts a group of symmetries of W, so some uh, group of symmetries. W, and this should be mirror to some other gadget, uh, some other function Cn to C, uh, along with some other uh, group of symmetries. Okay, so that's a little bit too general to really say anything about. So I want to specialize right away to uh, the case I'm going to talk about, uh, which is where the function W is just a uh, Fermat polynomial, uh, sum of xi to the ri, and the symmetry group is the full symmetry group of that potential uh, given by multiplying each, uh, each xi with appropriate ri through to unity. And this will be mirror to uh, w hat, which will be the same function, x1 to the r1 plus dot 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 plus xn to the rn but this time with just the uh, trivial group one acting. So there's a general setup uh, framework for the, these kinds of mirror pairs, um, uh, usually called bergman hoopsch uh, duality, which dates from the 1990s. But what we want to do as usual in mirror symmetry, there is some, um, well, something which usually gets called an A model, which has to do with something like counting curves and a B model, which has something to do with period intervals. So let me first start by talking about A model. 
And just to make it clear for the experts, we're gonna be talking about the A model on this side and the B model on this side. Okay, so let's talk about the A model first. And let me try to explain the closed version, uh, the classical version. And this is due to Fern Jarvis, Ron, and, and uh, many others. I'm going to stick with this particular uh, choice of functions. Everything I say, rather than giving the general setup, everything I say will, will be specific to this situation. So let's take D to be the least common multiple of the exponents R1 through Rn. Now what we'll do is we'll consider what we call D stable curves, uh, Orby curves. There in quotes because I haven't defined that yet, uh, with marked points. So what are these? These are our curves, which are really Deline Mumford stacks. These are one-dimensional DM stacks. Which are schemes away from the marked points. and nodes, I'm going to allow uh, stable curves here. Uh, and with stable coarse moduli space, so in the usual sense that the coarse moduli space is just an ordinary curve, will be a nodal curve uh, with some marked points and that curve should be stable in the usual sense of a stable curve. Um, so locally at marked points, Uh, these curves will look like um, an, or an, an Orbe curve. Looks like C modulo D roots of unity uh, acting in the usual way. And here D is, uh, recalls, is the least common multiple of the R1 through Rn. Uh, so each uh, mark point is a, um, is a, is a stacky point with a uh, stabilizer mu d. And the nodes look like, uh, again, we take the standard node x, y equals zero, and we divide out by mu d again. And this time the action is x, y goes to c, x, c inverse y for c and mu d. And uh, the fact that we use C and C inverse here is usually called the balance condition for, for these nodes. Uh, okay, so that's what our curves going, are going to look like. Uh, let me just try to draw some schematic of what these things look like. Uh, I'll draw something one dimensional, but uh, we might have uh, some nodes and marked points. And each of these marked points and each of these nodes our orbital fold points uh, with stabilizer group mu d, um, and in this case of nodes, the, uh, the these take a very specific form. Okay, um, the next piece of information I need is um, the the logarithmic sheaf of logarithmic differentials. Uh, one second, sorry. Hi, um, actually, I'm in the middle of a lecture. If you could come back later. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. I think someone was coming to collect the, the rubbish. Um, uh, okay, so we have um, omega C log is the sheaf of log range differentials on, on an Orbi curve C. And what's logarithmic? Well, we allow logarithmic poles, i.e. logarithmic poles at um, our points 
And we notice that if you have a marked point, so let's take, I'll use the coordinate Z on uh, C at a marked point. And the law of the pole there means you allow differentials of the form DZ over Z, so locally. Uh, at a marked point, allow differentials of form uh, dz over z. So we allow uh, you know, d log z. Now, the important point here is that uh, this is invariant under the group action. Uh, this is invariant. Under the group action z goes to cz. Uh, and as a result, this actually descends to a, a sheaf on the coarse moduli space. Uh, so in fact, omega c log is a, a vector bundle or is a pullback of a line bundle on the coarse moduli space. And I'll write this coarse moduli space of C as, as absolute value of C. So that's, um, that's of course, just the scheme where you forget about the stacky structure of the curve at the points, the, the mark points and, and the nodes. Uh, okay, so we have the bundle omega C log. Uh, now we're going to consider an extra bit of data. So we're going to consider additional data. of uh, bundles uh, since we have n variables in our Landau-Ginsberg model, uh, we're going to have n bundles corresponding to the, uh, and actually I want to use L here. Um, so we have n bundles along with isomorphisms Uh, tau i is an isomorphism between the rth power of li. So this is, these are bundles on C, uh, should be isomorphic to uh, omega C log. Okay, so these are a bunch of choice of, of uh, uh, ri roots of the sheaf of differentials. Okay, so this is the additional data. Uh, so ultimately what we're going to do is we're going to look at the moduli space of all curves of a given genus and a given number of marked points uh, with this extra structure. And from that, we will extract some invariance. Now, there's some extra information at the marked points because these bundles, these are, are bundles on the stack, not on the underlying coarse moduli space. Uh, so there's a local structure. So at a, at a marked point, Uh, Li locally looks like uh, C cross C mod mu D. So in other words, the bundle come, becomes trivial uh, when you lift it to the cover covering C of, of the uh, of C mod mu D. And uh, this is the, the uh, C cross C. It's, it's the total space of that trivial bundle. Uh, and then necessarily the action is given if I use coordinates Z on the original copy of C and W on the fiber uh, coordinate of the bundle, uh, the action becomes ZW uh, maps CZ and then C to some other number, let's call it M uh, times W. Uh, okay, um, so the, the M tells you something about the orbifold structure of the line bundle at the, the mark point. Um, and then we define the twist, what we call the i twist, that's uh, i as in the choice of index here, 
the ith twist uh, at the mark point Z uh, is the unique integer uh, twist I in the range of minus one to R minus two, uh, such that M is equal to D over R I times twist I plus one. And uh, so this plus one is just a convention of, of shifting, uh, shifting numbers by one. Uh, how do we know that such a number exists? Well, the point is that if you take the ri power of this line bundle, you're supposed to get omega c log. Omega c log is actually a bundle on the underlying coarse moduli space. Uh, so once you take the ri tensor power, uh, this action on this coordinate has to become trivial. So in other words, M has to be uh, divisible by um, D over RI. So let me just write that down. Necessarily D over RI divides M uh, because um, is Li tensor Ri uh, is pulled back from the course moduli space. So if you have seen this before, you'll, you'll know this is a perfectly standard way, or maybe we have a slightly different convention about uh, how we're encoding this information, but there's standard ways of encoding exactly how these line bundles interact with the, uh, the stabilizer group at these marked points. If you haven't seen it before, then probably what you should take away from this is the idea that there are uh, is some sort of discrete set of invariants, uh, numerical invariants, namely these twists encoding information about how this line bundle Li behaves at each mark point. Now we're also going to soup this up a little bit. So we also consider. Um, Uh, SI, um, I guess for the sake of this talk, uh, it's actually a bit more complicated, but I'm going to twist these uh, by those marked points where the uh, twist of ZJ is, is minus one. Um, there are various reasons for doing that, which I don't think I want to go into, but I want to be honest. Okay, so. Uh, we then define the Witten bundle. Okay. Well, maybe before I talk about the Witten bundle, um, we have a moduli space of these things. So, in general, if we fix the genus G, the number of mark points. N and uh, twists, uh, twist, uh, sorry, I should probably use a different letter because N was the number of, um, the number of uh, variables. Uh, let's say so twist uh, let me just write this twist, uh, write this as twi, um, a collection of twists. At the mark point. So if we specify which uh, twists we'll have at, at each of marked points, uh, we get a moduli space. We get a Boolean Mumford moduli space of all uh, such um, curves plus uh, data of L1 through Ln and tau1 through tau n. Uh, so I'll write this as uh, M bar W uh, G N twist. So the W is indicating the, um, uh, the, the potential we're using. Notice that the only way the potential really comes in here is that we have one line bundle for each variable and 
um, these reflect the monomials appearing in the potential. Oh, so we have such a uh, Mondrai space. And over this, we have a universal curve. Uh, C and M bar W G N list. Um, okay, so in nice cases, let's call this map pi. And again, this should be M, not N. So in nice cases, e.g. when G is, genus is zero, in fact, that's really the only nice case, we define Wi is R1 pi star of the i um, uh, of S sub i. So here I should say that this C comes along with universal bundles S1 through Sn. Remember, these were the twists of the allies. So there are these universal versions of these bundles on C, I can push forward. So this gives you the bundle, or this gives you a hopefully a bundle on the Maldry space whose fiber is the H1, is the cohomology of the ith one of these bundles. Um, now in general, so the conditions I gave guarantee that this is actually a bundle when the genus is zero. In general, it's not a bundle if the genus is higher than zero. And so you have to work harder. But what you can do is in this case, we can set W to be the direct sum I equal one to N WI. Uh, and then define uh, the corresponding FJRW invariant to be the Euler class of W or, or equivalent of the top chain class of W. So the, the really hard work which uh, Fan Jarvis and Ron did uh, was to actually define and much more generally define a virtual fundamental class on this Maldry space, uh, given this, this general setup and hence extract a number of invariants from it. Um, but uh, fortunately it's much easier in genus zero because in genus zero these, um, the SIs will always be of negative degree, so they might have H1, but they don't have many sections. And as a result, these really are bundles. And that's probably the chief reason why we uh, focus on uh, genus zero curves. Okay, um, so that's the description of the A model invariance uh, in genus zero. So let's go on now to the, the B model. So the B model was developed by Hurley, Shannon, Webb uh, using what's usually called Saito theory or Saito given tall theory. Uh, Saito had developed a general method of producing a Frobenius manifold structure from a, the universal unfolding of the singularity. I don't want to go through all the technical details of that. Um, but the main point of what they showed is that uh, closed genus zero uh, FJRW theory, and of course they do what I just discussed is the closed theory, can be extracted by studying oscillatory integrals. of the form integral over some cycle of e to the wt over h bar uh, f dx1 wedge dot dot wedge dxn um, where what are these various gaps? So first of all, um, 
WT is, is a universal unfolding. Of, um, uh, of W, which was our original function, xr to the ri, and here t will be some collection of coordinates on the universal unfolding. Um, F will be a function of x1 through xn, and the universal unfolding parameters will be a regular function. And uh, C, runs over a basis of what are they call good cycles. Um, so these uh, so so these are um, a middle dimensional in general non-compact cycles in Rn. That's right, CN. Uh, and they're indexed in the following way uh, with um, CA1 through AN. And here, zero is less than or equal to AI, is less than or equal to RI minus two, uh, with the property that. If I integrate this cycle over x1 to the a1 times dot 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 xn to the an, uh, e to the original w over h bar uh, dx1 wedge dot 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 wedge dxn, I get a product of delta, uh, sorry, I should put some primes here, uh, delta ai, ai prime. So dry, uh, delta function. And finally, I didn't tell you what h bar is. h bar is just some auxiliary parameter in C star. Now, the main point uh, when you're doing these kinds of integrals, if you haven't seen this before, uh, is that you need to, these cycles to be relatively well behaved in the sense that if they're going to be non compact, uh, the real part of W over H bar should go to minus infinity in the non compact directions uh, so that this integral has hope of conversion. So you can write down some specific basis of cycles uh, with this, which uh, has these particular properties. Um, and then those, those go into these, uh, these integrals here. Now, in general, this is, this is quite a long story to try to extract invariance from this. Uh, but it is possible, and what, this is what Hurley Shen would prove, is that by treating these integrals correctly, you do get uh, generating functions for all the closed FJRW invariants. Now, there's a point of view is that in general, it's not obvious why these kinds of weird integrals actually produce something on the mirror side, uh, but it can become much clearer why they produce the correct answer if you um, set things up correctly. So in particular, find the correct universal unfolding. Um, so of course, you know, in this procedure, uh, we just start with any old universal unfolding. I haven't told you anything about what characterizes this function f, but there's some complicated recipe for finding this function, uh, making this what uh, Saito calls a primitive form. And the goal is that if you find the correct universal unfolding, um, then everything should become much more transparent. And by 
compar um, analogy with the uh, with mirror symmetry uh, for fauna varieties, for let's say for phonic toric varieties. Uh, so this was uh, carried out by Fukaya uh, Ota o Ono. What you should do, uh, and, and also some work with myself uh, in the case of P2, what you should do, you should build the perturbation of W using some open type invariance. And that was at least the motivation for um, for this work from uh, the uh, from from mine and, and Tyler's end. Um, so what we're going to do is how we'll build on the case. Um, where w is equal to x the r, which is usually called the r spin case, uh, which was carried out by uh, Sasha Buryak, uh, Emily Clater, and uh, Ron Tesler. So they developed an open r spin theory. Um, and by generalizing that, we actually find uh, a number of, of interesting new, new phenomena. Okay, so that is um, the background. So now uh, let's try to explain what we've done that's new. So I need to explain something about open W spin theory. Okay, so uh, as is often the case when you're considering open Gurm Witten theory, uh, what you do is you consider uh, Riemann surfaces with anti holomorphic in involution. So we can consider data, say if C, uh, then a collection of marked points, I and I, and I'll have another collection of marked points marked by this, labeled by the same set. And then yet another collection of marked points uh, labeled by set B. And then I will have as before uh, these bundles S1 through Sn. Now we'll consider data of such of a curve or Orbi curve with these marked points and bundles, uh, spin bundles, um, equipped with in addition of anti holomorphic involution. Um, let's call it phi from C to C, along with lifts of these, this anti holomorphic involution, uh, phi i tilde of Si to Si of uh, lifts uh, of phi. So typically, we, we, we think of the fundamental domain uh, or a choice of fundamental domain for the anti homomorphic evolution as uh, uh, maybe a choice, let's call it sigma, instead of, uh, of C. Okay, so the typical picture here, uh, for example, we have a smooth uh, genus zero uh, um, curve, which means we really have a sphere. Um, we might have, uh, by the way, I should say that um, I should have said this, let me write this, that uh, phi of zi is equal to zi bar, phi of xi is equal to xi. So uh, zi bar is conjugate to 
zi. Uh, and so we have a number of points, say z1, z2. Uh, I will draw this upper hemisphere, that's sigma is the fundamental domain of the anti hallmark involution. We would then have the other, the, the conjugates of Z1 and Z2 living down there. And then the, uh, the points uh, X1, X2, X3 and so on live on the boundary of the disk. So more typically, I would just draw this by drawing a disk and mark points on the boundary. Okay, uh, so that's what we call, um, so of course we're, we're going to stick with genus zero. Um, there's anything that makes life harder um, is going to be even harder uh, when we're dealing with open things. And you know, there exists a moduli space. Uh, there exists moduli spaces. of these gadgets, of these uh, open um, W spin curves. And these will in general be orbifolds with corners, real orbifolds with corners. Uh, okay. So I now want to reduce to, uh, um, a special case that we'll now consider uh, because life gets combinatorially much more complicated and we're now going to focus on the case that we're currently writing up. I'm going to change notation a bit. I'm going to write W as X to the R plus Y to the S. So I have two variables um, instead of writing X1 to the R1 plus X2 to the R2. Okay, so um, now remember each mark point comes with uh, twists. So if a mark point has twists, say twist one equals A, twist two equals B, we will call it an A, B point. And so that's just keeping track of twists. Um, and we're going to do something else, which is the boundary points, we're only going to consider curves where the boundary points uh, are of three sorts. So I'll write boundary points as X's along the boundary. And we will only allow either points with twists R minus two zero, or points of twist um, zero S minus two, or we will in general allow at most one point in the boundary with twist R minus two S minus two. Uh, and these are called, we will also call these R points, uh, S points and roots. So the language is that we have one root, um, we have K, in general, we might have K1 R points on the boundary. K2 S points on the boundary. And a one uh, root. You also have, of course, some points uh, in the interior uh, with twists A1, B1, A2, B2, and so on. Okay, so now you have a moduli of such things. And we would like to define invariance uh, which I'm going to write as follows, uh, product I for one to N, tau to the AI BI. So this keeps track of the internal mark points.
And then we have a little bit of extra notation, which tells us how many boundary mark points we have. So we have um, K1 R points, K2 S points, and then one root, which we indicate by sigma one, two. Uh, so this is going to be some kind of numerical invariant extracted from the moduli space of disks of this form. So to do this, um, we replace the Witten bundles, which are complex bundles. Uh, with um, real bundles. So these are WI with real bundles. Right, it's WI prime, uh, whose fiber over a point C in the relevant Mongei space, I will not decorate the Mongei space uh, is um, the minus one eigenspace of phi i tilde acting on the first cohomology of SI. So remember phi i tilde is a lift of the anti-homeromorphic involution on the spin bundle SI and uh, so we get an action of phi i tilde on this cohomology group and we take the, the minus one eigenspace. Okay, so this gives us some, uh, some real bundles. This gives uh, the real wooden bundle. Uh, which we'll write as W prime as direct sum. Um, well, in this case, we only have two, two bundles. So I can just write this as W one prime plus W two prime. Now, the problem at this point is how do we actually define a numerical invariant? And the basic issue is that the moduli space isn't a complex, you know, isn't anything remotely like a complex manifold, it's a real orbifold with corners. Um, so how do we define uh, the uh, uh, enumerative invariance from this? <coughs> so the key point is that we need to specify boundary conditions. So let me give sort of a very simple example, which sort of illustrates exactly what the problem is. Suppose your moduli space is just a, uh, an interval, which it might well be. And suppose then uh, you're in a situation where you might actually be able to define some variance, which means that if we want to get a number, the, uh, the Witten bundle should be uh, a bundle of rank one over M bar W. Uh, in order for the, um, the the dimensions to work out. I'm assuming M bar W is one dimensional. Now, we might want to then take a section of this bundle and count the number of zeros. Now, if I take say this section, that's disjoint from the, the uh, I've drawn the zero section here as the moduli space is the zero section. So of course, this section of the bundle has no zeros. And I could just as well uh, have drawn a slight perturbation of this uh, section and well, I guess something like that. This section does have two zeros, but of course you should count these sections with some kind of sign. And uh, the, uh, once you count zeros with sign, you'll still have um, no zeros. So in this case, I can imagine, uh, I can imagine that I've only considered sections which satisfies some boundary condition where um, the, the values of the section of the endpoint are say positive in the sense that they lie uh, above the, uh, the zero, the zero section. 
But I could, for example, consider some different set of boundary conditions, uh, say where I insist that the section be positive R on this end, but then be negative on this end. And then that forces us to have a zero, maybe counted with, with a, a minus sign, but uh, it does give us a zero. So as long as we fix the boundary conditions, uh, you can make sense of the number of zeros of a section. It makes sense. the number of zeros, or more generally of an Euler class, uh, given uh, boundary conditions for your sections. Okay, so the key point then is to, uh, to understand what the boundary strata of our Moduli space looks like, uh, so that we can then then impose boundary conditions. Okay, well, here are a couple of ways that. Um, uh, let me try to write this in a more legible manner. Um, so here's one way that a disk could degenerate. So we could have some internal points, some boundary points. And if two of these internal points come together, you have to bubble off a sphere. And so the picture that looks something like this, we have a disk with, with a sphere attached to it and then maybe some internal mark points. Okay, so this is one typical degeneration. But notice this is really co-dimension two. This happens, um, uh, this is really sort of analogous to convex degeneration. This happens, this is co-dimension two. So it doesn't actually contribute to the boundary. Just think of this as happening somewhere in the interior of the, the modular space. A second situation, if I, instead of drawing a disk, draw the, the sphere with anti-holomorphic involution, a second possibility is that this degenerates to a union of two spheres like this in such a way that say this upper sphere is sigma. So here we had sigma, the fundamental domain of the anti holomorphic involution uh, degenerating to this. Uh, so in other words, what happens is that the, the boundary of this disk gets contracted to a point. And this is called a contracted boundary. Now this does happen in, in co-dimension one. So this happens whenever you have a node which is fixed under the anti-homomorphic involution. Uh, so this, it does contribute to the boundary. of the modular space. Now there's some way of defining, it's, it's technical, but there exists a way of defining um, a natural way, hopefully natural way of defining positivity at such points. Positivity for sections of um, the Witten bundle W prime uh, at points of M bar W uh, corresponding to such degeneration. So we're, we're able to essentially take care of those, those for free. Now, the third case is, um, again, it's sort of easier to see this at first by uh, drawing the, the complex picture instead of the disk, uh, seeing that a sphere degenerates to two spheres again, but this time the two spheres interact like this. So there's our original disk and now the disk splits up into two disks. So if I were to draw this, um, I would have one disk degenerating to 
the union of two disks meaning at a point in the boundary. Now, remember we have a number of, of boundary points. I haven't given much concern about those points, but there are R points, S points, uh, and a root. Now, when you have a node, uh, nodes also have twists. I didn't tell you about that, but it's, it's easy to see uh, using exactly the same form, those nodes of twists. And uh, the form of the action. So it depends which side of the node you're you're um, uh, um, you're on. So so the the twist isn't well defined. It's there are two twists. One for um, sort of how the bundle behaves over here, and one for how the bundle behaves over here. And um, the, the thing I mentioned, which is called the balancing condition, the form of the action of the stabilizer on the node uh, forces the twist to look like A, B on one side for some A and B and R minus two minus A, S minus two minus B on the other side. Uh, so twists at nodes come in pairs and they're, they, they're related in this way. Okay, so um, if we are in a situation uh, where A is not zero R, R minus two or B is not zero or S minus two, then there's again a way of defining positive section. as a way of imposing a positivity condition uh, for sections of the Witten bundle. at such degenerate points. Okay, again, I don't want to get the details. However, if A or B, or if both A and B take this form, then um, notice we can normalize this and we get, so here's the, here's the real point. It's really the punchline of the whole paper. Uh, we can normalize this. If uh, A is in zero R minus two, B is in zero S minus two, We can normalize. So we're going to get two disks. Uh, again, we had some boundary points uh, that we already had. I, I didn't draw them in the previous picture, but we have these extra boundary points. So for example, if A is, is zero and B is S minus two, this would be zero S minus two. And then this will be R minus two zero by the form I wrote down uh, for this pair of twists. So in other words, if we're in this situation, then it's almost true that these normalized disks are exactly the sort of disk that we would define before. Uh, there's one case where things aren't, which is namely if, for example, A and B are both zero, uh, then we would have a zero, zero point here, which we aren't allowing, and R minus two, S minus two point here, which is a root. Um, so we actually might end up getting more than one root in this process. Uh, but there's actually, it turns out that points of twist zero, zero can just be forgotten. They won't affect the Witten bundle. Okay, so then um, I can't really go through the details because we're almost out of time. Uh, but you are then able to define boundary conditions inductively. 
if you understand uh, what your sections of the Witten bundle look like for modular space of these disks, there's some nice behavior of the Witten bundles under pullback, um, and you're able to actually construct boundary conditions inductively. So these are the kinds of these are the kinds of disks. Uh, we are considering and can construct boundary conditions inductively. So the net result is that we do get some invariance, but they do depend on a choice of boundary conditions. Um, this inductive procedure uh, gives some kind of a coherence to the set of boundary conditions as we range over all possible uh, moduli spaces. And once we do that and get some invariance, they aren't necessarily well defined because the boundary conditions involve choices. But so um, this all involves some choices. Uh, but given a choice, uh, we get um, uh, sets of invariants or collections of invariants. So these are not well-defined invariants, but nevertheless, we do get a collection of invariants. And in particular, I can use these invariants to deform the, to perturb the potential. And uh, so here's the perturbed potential, uh, Wt. Um, this is a slightly complicated formula. Uh, summation k1, k2, uh, l greater equal to zero, uh, minus one to the l minus one. Um, and then we have product, uh, uh, sorry, I'm also summing over Uh, multi sets A. Um, this is a multi set of twists for internal mark points. Multi set of twists of size L. Um, and I have a sign which I need, and then I multiply this by the uh, Um, invariant that we've now been able to find. Um, and uh, so this is uh, invariant. I interpret this to be zero if uh, the dimensions don't work uh, to expect us to have a finite number of zeros for a section of the Witten bundle. And I have to keep track of um, more information product i equal one to l t sub a i b i x the k one y to the k two and this lives in the following ring um, so the tabs are variables uh, ranging over the indices range between zero and r minus two and zero and s minus two so I have a big polynomial ring like that. And then I take a formal power series ring over that uh, in X and Y. And this is, this can be proved, um, mark modulo uh, this, uh, the ideal generated by the T8, sorry, the ideal generated by the TAB squared, uh, W is equal to X to the R plus Y to the S uh, plus summation TAB uh, X to the A, Y to the B. And notice this is the standard, um, this is the standard uh, 
Uh, I should write WT. This is the standard universal unfolding. Of, of W. Uh, so what's happening is that to higher order, we get possibly lots of in interesting invariants hiding in this, this potential. And then I can finally state um, the, the main theorem, then I'll, I'll stop. Um, so the theorem is that this is the correct, um, the correct potential in the sense that E is the WT over H bar times DX wedge DY. When I integrate it over this element of the good basis, gives me uh, exactly the form I want to see, um, delta A zero times delta B zero uh, plus T A B H bar inverse plus sum algorithm equal to two, sum A equals AI, Bi with a sum over a multi set of size L uh, minus one to the L minus one, uh, minus one to some. Uh, I may not worry too much about this. There's some extra sign. I know. Um, and then uh, included inside the sum is a delta R of A, A, delta R of B. Uh, B, sorry, delta S of A, B over the automorphism group of A times a closed invariant. Um, uh, so maybe I need to actually, sorry, I do need to put this in. What have I just done? Uh, minus D of A minus two, um, that should be a minus H bar there. Um, and then we have tau uh, R minus R of A minus two, sorry, this, this is exactly the kind of formula I hate seeing written down in talks. Um, Um, so this is a closed invariant. This index here, D of A, specifies a descendant invariant, which I didn't talk about, but is defined in the usual way where you uh, cap the Euler class or cut the Euler class with the uh, uh, some number of copies of the um, uh, descendant, uh, the first chain class of the descendant bundle. And uh, these R of A's and B of A's are uh, defined um, R of A congruent to some I equal one to, to L A I and is um, chosen to be between zero and R minus one S of A congruent to some I equal one to L B I zero less than equal to S of A less or equal to R minus S minus one. Uh, okay, so there's there's a lot of information here, um, but let me let me just sort of really say what the punchline is here. So this is exactly the formula that you expect mirror symmetry to give. That after you do something magical to these oscillatory integrals or the original oscillatory integrals that um, really Shen Webb brought down you should get a generating function. Um, oh, I've certainly missed some terms here. Um, I need something like product of T A I B I equal one to L. Um, this is exactly the kind of expression that you should get out of the intervals, the kind of information. Uh, so what this is saying is that actually you don't need to do anything magical. You just compute the integrals and out drops the actual um, uh, closed invariance from it. Um, okay, uh, so I think I really better stop. Let me just mention that there's also, as I said, the, the, um, 
the uh, we don't have unique choice of invariants. Invariants aren't unique, but there's a very pleasant wall crossing structure for going between various sets of invariants. And no matter which invariants you use, you will still get the same, same uh, result here. Okay, so I better stop because I'm over time. Thank you. Okay, um, so we're a bit over time, but I happen to have some time for questions. So if people want to ask questions and um, Mark is not uh, having to run somewhere else, maybe we can have some question time. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm good till 4.30, but... Uh... Are there anyone who wants to ask something or? No? Okay, maybe we'll leave it here then. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Really yeah. good. You're welcome. Uh, I...